Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Tyler Sweeney. I'm here with my buddy Nick. So, this is this new segment we're going to be doing. And one of my favorite things about my buddy Nick is that the way people check their smartphones and uh, check their Facebooks all the time, I see him with a Kindle on him at all times. And he always seems to be reading something interesting. Uh, he's one of those people that can dedicate a lot of energy to reading. I'm not as good about that. And so the books that I do choose to spend a lot of time on, I like to get good suggestions from people who I trust their opinion. And Nick is definitely one of those people. If they, I'm, glad, I'm glad you take that as a compliment. Um, interesting thing lately is there's a lot of talk about adaptations of young adult novels. Uh, the Hunger Games were young adult novels. The Giver, one of my favorite books ever from when I was a kid, got adapted. And then there seems to be a lot of adaptations surrounding the author, John Green. He's very popular through his um, Mental Floss magazine and YouTube channels and websites. Very interesting figure, and I have never read any of his books. Nicholas, you have. I have read all his major works, uh, Paper Towns, Buns of Catherine's, his first book, Looking for Alaska, and The Folds in Our Stars. Okay, so he knows about this guy, and today we're going to talk about why would I read John Green? And Nick is going to be our advocate here, presenting some arguments about why you should read John Green, and maybe, you know, what type of person would like to read a John Green book. So Nick, you said you read a bunch of his books. Yep. I mean, Let's break it down kind of like book by book. Yep. Let's start with his uh, first book, uh, Looking for Alaska. And this focuses on our protagonist looking for like what he calls the great perhaps, like adventure, discovery, having like his own like small group and then like going on like misadventures. And the way he does this is he's going to a boarding school. Mm -hmm. So he just like uh, just get away from everything and just like create his own adventure and during his time there he meets a girl called Alaska mm -hmm. and she's what we'd call nowadays is a manic pixie dream girl uh. and people might know like examples are you know Ramona Flowers from Scott Pilgrim vs. the World mm -hmm. just very like all over the place and talkative and outgoing and mm -hmm. very mood changes quite a lot and he becomes like enamored with just like her being and it just focuses on just him really is admiring her and building up this whole fantasy about her but being constantly frustrated of like just not really knowing hmm. who she is and like trying to figure her out and like want to like comfort her when she's just off her own like world and it's not it's not a story of like the, oh, boy falls in love with girl, boy pines after, just wants to get with her. It really highlights, like, just that disconnect of, like, trying to, like, of, like building up an idea of someone and not really knowing them at all. So, during all this whole uh, spiel with Alaska, it, the whole theme of the book centers around, like, a spirituality mm -hmm. and, like, what how like we live our lives and like what happens after we die and like it does this by like breaking down like living life is um they make this the, the metaphor they use is like this the maze of suffering and mm -hmm. it's like and the life we live like how do we get out of that maze right. and it's like this whole journey is just finding a way through that maze and like what's the answer and, mm -hmm. and John Green's like ability to like um, profess like his thoughts on the whole matter and he does it just through these young characters and through these characters he he really is able to articulate his his opinion but not like it's gonna sound pretend, like I don't feel like he's telling me his, his ideas but like his characters are like discovering this and right. showing all that so it doesn't come off as preachy no it doesn't come off as preachy at all it's very natural. It, it's not, and it doesn't like delve like get really heavy. Mm -hmm. Like there's some heavy stuff. Stuff goes down. There's like a countdown. It's like a hundred and ten days before, and you're like, before what? And, like that's like each uh, chapter, and it keeps counting down. Like as the year goes on, 
and you're like, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? And then it just, but like when stuff does go down, like when like heavy stuff does happen, it's still like kept light. He's very humorous. He, it doesn't feel like the tone isn't like drawing us like, oh god, this is where we are. Like it doesn't like there's no like dramatic tone shifts, mm. even though it does deal with some heavy subject matter. But yeah, looking for Alaska. Probably my second favorite added is uh, four of books. Excellent. So so sounds like it's got elements of spirituality, mm -hmm. uh, relationship dynamics. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe exploration of atypical relationship dynamics mm -hmm. and then of course it's this suspense building towards something yeah and uh so this sounds like it could be a pretty intriguing book for somebody that likes mysteries a little bit yeah but also people that like character driven pieces mm -hmm. um i was gonna say one other thing we're gonna put a link in the description to an interesting article i just read about the guy who coined the phrase Manic Pixie Dream Girl, really? and uh, how he regrets pointing the phrase Manic Pixie Dream Girl, because he feels like it's led to some um, pigeonholing of actual people, not just characters. There's been a lot of arguments against Manic Pixie Dream Girls being like male fantasies and not actually being so any, dead. right, right, not uh, like not reflecting real people, um, you know, making people look too narrow of a descriptor. And uh, so it's actually an interesting article that we'll put a link in the doobly doo. But yeah, that's why you mentioned like. Wanting to like deconstruct that stereotype because in his next book, Paper Towns, mm -hmm. he really delves into that dynamic of like how we uh, focus on our main character, our Quentin, mm -hmm. and he meets in his he has his childhood friend, uh, Margot Spiegelman. Uh, apologies if I butcher your last name, guys. It focuses on the whole boy girl relationship and like how he really liked her when they were younger. But like as like school as the years went on and like high school and all that, she kind of was like one of the more popular people. And he was more like the band geeks. Mm -hmm. And Paper Towns really focuses on just like how we like perceive other people, and like and just like how we don't really know someone and like just like the way was we see people like every day like like a certain like filter like develops. And like then we just like perceive people how we perceive them, not like how who they actually are. And that's what it was with uh, Margo. And then Margo is like he like was really enamored with her, and it's like this like like this legend. Like she's like around the school, she's like this legend who like pulls pranks and these schemes and like keeps like order in the school and like keeps the jocks away from the nerds and like just had this like aura around her. It seemed like she was just like like otherworldly. And like mm -hmm. he like built up this like whole idea of her, and again like wanting to be with her and all that, and she always went on these like kicks of like like leaving school for like a few days to like join the circus or taking like a spontaneous trip to Mississippi, and then coming back like a week later with all these stories, and then I really swear like it, it happens three chapters into the book like suddenly she like leaves, but then doesn't come back, mm -hmm. and. And then that like just propels this like whole like mystery deduction, suspense like it almost feels like a young adult like this thriller like of like figuring out like where she did it where right. she went, and like usually she leaves like clues to like where she's going but like this time like she leaves like, no clues and like Quentin and his pals need to or Quentin mainly like leads the charge of like trying to find Margot and like just hoping he's okay and like like during this whole time of like. Uncovering all these clues, Dark Green once again, like, and there's like the same of like, just like, just how we like look at others and mm -hmm. him trying to like, Quinn trying to like figure out like, did he even know who this feeling right. was? But she's like, in one of his quotes, like, she was so enamored with like mysteries, she became one. Right. And like, it's like his whole thing of just wanting to understand her and. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a, I would say John Green's probably the most well written uh, young adult novel, and probably my favorite, just in just the way it's written, how it's paced. Again, classic you know, John Green humor, um, and just like the subject matter doesn't get in the way of that humor and just the lightheartedness and just the adventure that like John Green really puts you on, and. Um, I'll explain like the title of Paper Towns 
the reason Margot leaves is because they it takes place in um, Orlando, Florida, mm -hmm. and the paper town is like something that's like a town that's like very big, but there's this when you like look at like the entire landscape, you see like a lot of like empty like uh, warehouses and like abandoned amusement parks and as these places just went unfinished yeah. and she just got so tired of that charade that she just out of the mud yeah. and Quinn being a person that kind of like buys into the whole you know gonna graduate high school gonna go to college family kids and all that is like is forced to like face the reality that maybe some people might like he might not be able to be this person who can be with Margot and all that. All right. And it's a really good journey of just mm. and some it's a book I feel like um, people in the high school, like entering ninth grade should probably read mm. because like I know it's like middle school, people might be familiar with a uh, Star Girl by Jerry Spinelli mm -hmm. and that breaks down the whole clicky popular like it's not always good to fit in and all that. And with Paper Towns, I feel like it takes a whole new level of like, instead of those broad groups, like focusing on just like the person like you are and like who you become and like who your friends are. And just, it's something that like, whether it's like your friends or the more popular of the jocks, like there's still people yeah. that have their own like faults and perks and all that stuff and like you, I feel like freshmen entering that whole new tier of the high school I should should have it, this be their summer reading okay. so we're dealing with high school stuff mm -hmm. we're dealing with relationship stuff and atypical relationship stuff again mm -hmm. but we're also dealing with uh, identity and I like the idea of um perceptions of people versus their identity and how people's identities can connect or can't connect. This sounds like a pretty good read. Uh, yeah. And when you incorporate, you're talking about like the mystery aspect of it, like mm -hmm. where did she go? Mm -hmm. Is she coming back? Uh, does it matter? Like, uh, yeah. yeah, so that's some interesting stuff going on there. It would be the book I'd recommend to start. If you're entering John Green's work, Paper Towns, definitely. It's either gonna make or break your so if you don't like Paper Towns, you're not going to like any of them? It, I would say it's entry level. That everyone's a gas, so we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, but Paper Towns, like, I would just recommend, like, if you don't like Paper Towns, you might like the others, but, like, if you don't like the humor or whatever, I don't think you might like John Green's work. But Paper Towns, like, just, like, it's just very well made and whole, and I really can't find many criticism about it, so it's like it's I feel like it's his best work so I feel like it would be the best entry level book okay. for John Green. So that sounds like a great read honestly I'm already looking forward to checking that out. What book is next in the in this in the German Green canon? I think I may have skipped this one but I think it came after I was looking for Alaska but um there's the abundance of Catherine's mm -hmm. and this one I've only read through once, but it's it's was the like tail end of my John Green uh, kick. I read uh, Looking for Alaska, Paper Towns, Fallen Our Stars, and I rounded off with a bunch of Catherine's. But I'm glad I did, as this is like just like straight on, just like humorous. Like there's this guy who's dated only Catherine's uh -huh. variations, with a C with a K, this sort of spelling, this sort of spelling, and like he's gone through like 13 Catherine's. And they've just, at some point or other, like, all broken up with him. And it's, like, him trying to find, like, this, like, equation right. to explain, like, why does this keep happening to me? Why am I doomed to only be attracted to Catherine's, be in a relationship with Catherine's, and be have my heart broken by Catherine's? <laughs> and it's just this whole, this, like, it, whole, like, just misadventure of, of him and his and his buddy just trying to figure out what in the world is going on. I think they just, I think they graduate high school and they just take a spontaneous road trip. <laughs> and they just, just like, during the road trip, just 
this he's just like mulling this over and and really I don't think it has like any particular theme. It's just straight up just fun. This <laughs> John Green is being entertaining and and it's one of his probably more absurd novels. Sure. Like if Paper Tones made in gay or fancy just Amongst Catherine's might just, just be a little fun read. Yeah. And but so like it sounds like because of the kind of looseness of the story that yeah. he can kind of go wherever he wants with it. Right? Oh yeah. Like he can go different places and make different jokes and yep. maybe even like do like mini themes. Yeah. Oh, that's, that sounds like a yeah. fun read. Yeah. That's a nice. How, how long read. about are his books? Same novel length, I say like 200 pages. Yeah. Um, cool. A little less. Not too. And easy read too, you know, yeah. novels. So I was able to, I, looking for Alaska, I read, I think, in one sitting. Wow. And that might have been a mistake because the halfway point. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. Really, yeah. <laughs> but, but no, great reads. Like, I, I got through them all, I think, in like about a week, week and a half. Just casually reading, so no, and it keeps you, it keeps you going. He really has a really good way of like upping and like intrigue and like keeping you turning yeah. pages. So awesome, be good. So I think the last one, yeah, it, probably is the most well known. Yeah, because I mean this is a, a big one movie, New York Times bestseller. Mm -hmm. His first movie that his first book that got turned into a movie, mm -hmm. The Faults in Our Stars. All right. First off, I just gotta. I wanted. I, I. I'm hoping that we can dispel the idea that this is a chick book. Yeah. It is not a chick right. book. Right. And I, I think a lot of people see John Green because they see this. They see the Fall of the Stars as a chick book and a chick movie. That. I mean, whether or not yeah. anything should be classified as a chick book or a chick movie, is a whole other thing <laughs> that you don't want to get me started on. But. I think some of his maybe his his works get painted with a broad brush because of people's impressions about his most well-known work mm. and so let's talk about that and let's talk about maybe dispelling some of those myths yeah like the false of stars isn't my sister's keeper right it's not he has John is in a ability of like touching on like really real heavy topics even dealing with cancer and like having someone else knowing someone else who has cancer and dealing with that like he has an ability to like not have just the whole mood just be brought down. He just he still keeps it light, still keeps it fun, even though it's dealing with something very, very hard. And in the Pulse Our Stars, the main character is uh, a woman, Hazel Grace, teenager. But like, I don't feel like he's writing about oh, this is how a woman would deal with this, and her friend uh, Augustus Waters. This is how he deals with it, being a man. It's just he writes about how does people deal with right. these these difficult things, whether it's cancer, this growing pains, friendships, whatever. Like it doesn't break it down and define it. Like oh, this is how I'm writing this from a male's point of view. So this is how a man deals with it. This is how I'm writing from a girl's point of view. This is how I feel like a girl would deal with it. Mm -hmm. So I feel like the whole label of the false star stars being a chick flick or a book for chicks is um, unfounded. I feel like he just writes books just mm -hmm. for people to relate to and understand, like, or give an idea, like, just what it's like to go through right. this sort of thing. That's cool. I've, I've heard similar things about, um, similar things said of, like, about the same kind of thing, but it's like the idea of, like, even at the end of the day, if men and women are as disparately, um, like, d d different yeah. as uh, everyone says they are, like, if, if 90s stand-up routines are to be believed or whatever, yeah. we still have more in common with women than we do with, like, anybody. Like, yeah. I mean, like, I mean, like, that we're, we're, we're all human beings. Yeah. And, like, like, that we, we, some of our responses, a lot of our responses to big things in our lives at the core are the yeah. same, you know what I mean? And yeah. I, I like the idea of maybe, maybe kind of just dealing with like the common denominator, yeah. like the thing that makes us human rather than trying to uh, 
to like gender stratify things. Yeah, and the, like the way he differentiates them is like his characters, like with Hazel Grace, like she's very like like I don't want to like leave my having being someone with cancer and having her parents deal with it. Like she doesn't want to like she said it puts him on, like leave a scar. Like right. she doesn't want to like get some, have people be so attached to her. Like when she does finally pass away, mm -hmm. she doesn't want to cause any pain. Right. From her passing, but with Augustus Waters, like, like before his diagnosis, like he was like a basketball star, and he, even during cancer, like he wanted to leave his mark on the world. Right. He wanted to be remembered, yeah. and that's less mm. his gender and more just like his just his desire and his aspirations, sure. and just like conquering. That. I I really like that because there's a lot of stuff that people put like in, on on kind of like these Tumblr esque meme things about yeah. like about like the differences between scars and leaving a mark, leaving a scar and leaving a mark and everything. And it's one of those things that has become like watered down and kind of like, you know, like, like uh, Instagram filter, like, you know, click, you know, like, yeah. you know, like to the point where it means very little. Mm -hmm. But if you actually think about that concept and it sounds like he deals with it here, uh, even though it's a young adult book in a mature yeah. way, uh, that that can be a really powerful concept. Oh, the whole, the whole thing of, when he tackles the whole thing of when people pass away, like say like a young, like a teenager passed away, like in high school, like then like a lot of people like come out of the woodwork and say, oh my yeah. God, he was so great. I, 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 I miss I, him so much. I can't believe I didn't yeah. tell him I loved him. And yeah, it's yeah. like, you didn't even talk to him. You didn't even know him. Right. Why are you writing on his wall? Why are you giving these big empty sentiments. Oh god, yeah. The, the empty sentiment stuff about um, just the way people, I think, bastardize a lot of uh, even religious stuff uh, about about deaths, especially young, amongst young people. About mm -hmm. um, I think the one that g gets me the most is the Heaven Need Another Angel and right. stuff like it that. Does, oh, I, that. I, I, I seriously, seriously, like, if you say that, like, you really need to step back and examine that that se that sentiment all right and seriously question it and i'm sorry i don't mean to sound preachy here uh you know just you know please please reconsider that that sentiment now that i'm done with my soapbox moment about uh dealing with the passing of people and especially of youth we're gonna <laughs> bring it back to the matter at hand which is the fall of our the stars, of stars. So, yeah, dealing with just People either not want to minimize damage <coughs> when they pass away or want to leave them like a right pass away. All empty sentiments of people around them after they pass on, he tackles that. Hazel, her philosophy of like not wanting to like leave a scar and like in, in like the first chapter she professes her just like belief of like pretty much death is inevitable. It's a, she puts it, it's all shout into the void. And we're, we're all just killing time. And it's just, <laughs> and she just says like, and that's just her way of just coping with her reality. It's just like, whether I'm passing away like next month, pretty much everything around me, what you see mm -hmm. is going to right. eventually just fall apart and just go away. And it really, it really shows just that whole perspective, just like, and John, we just, I don't know what, he usually gives a, like a, afterwards, like, like what gave him this idea to make this book. I'm not sure if he either had a friend who was dealt with cancer, like, he just does a really good job, like, I guess, like, empathizing and, like, even though he's not, he didn't deal with cancer. Mm -hmm. Himself, he still has a really good way of just professing like what that must be like, and he really I feel like nails just a bit of like cancer survivors or patients are dealing with, and like just how they cope with it and how they get through it. Mm -hmm. That sounds like some really mature stuff, and and also sounds like that it's it's it sounds reasonable. I feel like with some of these bigger issues, sometimes people can be 
I don't know if they can say po polar. They can go, yeah. you know, one one yeah. way or the other. I but I like you preachy, right? Like he just, yeah, he really just nails to make to to make a book about finding the balance between like leaving a mark slash leaving a scar and balance that with being a shout into the void and to do it all in a way that can be portrayed on screen by Cheyenne Woodley. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. Also, Cheyenne Woodley, very interesting person. I saw her on Top Chef Duels. Apparently, she is she was like one of the guest judges. Apparently, she forages for like her own mushrooms and plants and stuff. Oh, yeah. She's like a, kind of a badass, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting. So, if you've seen the movie, I have not seen the you movie. You've not seen the movie yet. It's just it's a mood thing. Like yeah. it's like I've read the books and I'm like, right. do I really want to like sit down and right. just like just get be drained? Yeah. Right, because after two hours. I felt that way about I've read the book, I've listened to the soundtrack of this movie, the movie I'm so big of the movie. I read the book, I heard the soundtrack, I saw the musical. And there's no way I am sitting through Les Miserables again. I'm sorry. I just got to put that out there. I'm sorry. Once was enough. Oh, I man. cried my eyes out. I don't care how good Anne Hathaway is. I know Anne Hathaway is good. I trust her. Man. Hugh Jackman, no, he's good. I yeah. trust her. I think Russell, P Russell Crowe's not as bad as people say. But there's no way I'm going to freaking like, deal with the crippling depression of Les Miserables for like three hours again. I was not going to. I don't care how excellent the the drums and everything make you feel at the end. Like I just can't, right? I just can't. I won't, and I'm not even sorry about it. But yeah, so like. Oh yeah, I'm still, and they're making Paper Towns, which is coming out this summer. This summer. This summer, You're July. Here. Yeah, a year after *The Fault in Our Stars* came out. Oh, it's, yeah. They're making Paper Towns, and I definitely will see Paper Towns. Less happy than *The Fault in Our Stars*. Mm. Um, that was the one that you were describing. It sounded like I want to see it. Yeah, I, I yeah, want to read it. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And they, maybe I'll test out my uh, my theory about. I have this theory about how uh, people always read books and then see movies and then are disappointed with the movies. I have a couple times with uh, Fight Club and High Fidelity, respectively. I saw the movies of those two books before I read the books, and uh, I got all I got a full new set of enjoyment out of the books after I saw the movies and I can watch those movies again and they don't feel hollow to me whereas I don't know like let's just I don't know, like, let's go let's say like a movie like I don't know like a book like The Hobbit like I really liked that book and maybe I'm not a huge fan of the movies maybe the fact that I'm not a huge fan of the fact that there's more than one of them um, but that's a whole other video but but I think that I have this theory that actually people should see the movies enjoy them for what they are and then they're more likely to enjoy the book after seeing the movie than vice versa so maybe i'll test that out with paper towns yeah and, uh, and i just finish up like hmm? just his whole and the whole like what books does he what audience does he cater to hmm. i feel like even though these are young adult novels i feel like you can read these even as an adult like Postgraduate, but as for people who are his target age group, like from like 16, 18 year olds, I feel like John Green like articulates thoughts and ideas and feelings mm -hmm. of the whole teenage, his teenage audience that just like around that age, like we just haven't gotten to the point where we can actually like articulate like what we're going through. Right. And it's not until like we're in our 20s and mm -hmm. our later informative years that we can like look back and say, oh, I was feeling this way this way because X, Y, and Z. And mm -hmm. I feel like John Green like provides that insight for teenagers mm -hmm. and then also aligns this, the hindsight that adults feel when looking back on those years. Sure. And I feel like John Green just gives his own take and perspective on just that whole, right. those, those years. And does it in a way that it doesn't feel like when your parents say like, trust me, when oh, they're, no, they're uh, 10 years <laughs> from now, this is gonna, no, no, right, he, yeah. He's very relatable, very perceptive and empathetic and not condescending or patronizing That's great. to his audience and it's just, just very, very good author. Well, Nick, you made a very compelling argument about all his books. I, for one, am convinced I'm going to check out uh, at least Paper Towns and perhaps uh, 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 Abundance of Castles. Yeah. Both of those sound like something right up my alley uh, that I definitely want to check out. 
if any of these books sound like they might be something you're interested in, check them out. Uh, I'd suggest going to a library. And if we're going to be hipsters about it, I'll say go to a local bookstore, because local bookstores are great. But of course, there's lots of other ways to get books with uh, Amazon, yada yada yada, Kindles and what have you. The most important part is that you're reading these books, because uh, the audience is what makes uh, these amazing authors get to make more books. So please support an author, check out these books, let us know what you think. You can hit me up on Twitter, I'm Proof of Tyler, or you can hit us up on our Facebook page, The Proof is in the Concept, or leave comments right here on our YouTube channel. Thank you guys for joining us. Nick, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. Have a great day.